feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. I'm your co-host, Ted Jenkin. Here is my co-host, Lee Heisman. We'll bring in our guest in just a minute today. He's a doctor of pharmacy and entrepreneur. He owns multiple businesses. I'm going to talk all about, I don't know if I can say this, Lee, but I think somewhere in here, it was like fat kid to pharmacist. And we're going to, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about all of that right here on the shrimp tank and uh, welcome everybody. You know, uh, Lee and I, for the last 10 years, we brought you some of the brightest and best entrepreneurs in and around the United States. Check out all, all of the videos of our entrepreneurs at shrimptankpodcast.com, or you can go to our YouTube channel. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button. You can hear Tony Horton from P90X. You can hear the co-founder of Spanx. You can hear Brian Dawkins, Hall of Fame Safety from the Philadelphia Eagles, and so many more entrepreneurs, any, anywhere from people who have owned a company of one to a company of more than a thousand. And, and uh, we've talked to CEOs of publicly traded companies to people that basically have something on Main Street. And we do this show because it's really hard to figure out sometimes how to be successful as an entrepreneur and getting this combination of street smarts and book smarts and no, you don't have to get bloody all the time. You're going to get bloody most of the time, but you don't have to get bloody all the time. And that's why we do this show to tell you how to start a business, how to grow it, how to scale it. And of course, for our sponsors and Lee and I's company, Exit Stage Left Advisors, maybe one day you exit stage left. We'd be the guys to help you sell that company for lots and lots of money. How do we know this? We sold a whole bunch of our own companies and we still sell them. So we know how to do this. <clears throat> Lee, I'm excited today because... One of the major problems that we've had in America for quite some time, and you'll see this on the news all the time, is what's happening with the cost of health care and especially the cost of medications. Uh, major changes recently to insulin and other things that are happening out there. But people are going, good, good God, I go into a pharmacy today. I, I don't even know. Do I, do I do the store brand? Should I do the generic brand? I mean, how much of this stuff cost me? My health insurance is changing all the time in terms of these different tiers of prescriptions. It's just such a difficult thing. So we have on the uh, expert today and the founder of Drugstore2 with the number 2 door.com, AJ Asgari. And uh, AJ, I just, I guess I just want to start this thing. And basically, your your childhood actually had a whole bunch of influence in how you got in the business today? Oh, for sure. Just in motivation, period. <laughs> you know, we always kind of look back and try to figure out like what makes us so weird and why are we wired the way we're wired? And was this a genetic mishap or uh, did something drive us young in our, you know, our our pre-puberty life that kind of just set the, set the pace? And one of of those key factors I reflected back was being a fat kid um, and not just being a fat kid because I wanted to be a fat kid. I was yeah. a fat kid because I didn't know how to do anything about it, you know, <laughs> and there was someone who came into my life early on who uh, taught me, kind of gave me the tools, showed me the way. Obviously, you got to do all the work, right? So it was this beautiful analogy for all things business, all things you want to do, all things achievement turns into, man, you got to show up when it's fun. You got to show up when it sucks. You got to show up, show up, show up, show up, show up. And it just kind of bled into everything. And so that was my first early kind of turn. Hey, AJ, I remember even today because I was a fat kid too, you know, and I would say not like obese, obese fat, but like you get teased on all the time. Oh, yeah. And I remember growing up and when they had tough skins, there were only three sizes. It was basically like, Slim or small, medium, and husky. the worst word in husky. the world, husky. <laughs> yeah, we were definitely husky. We were yeah, definitely nobody husky. in life, it just, it sounds so bad, the word to begin with, husky, just says yeah. you're just gigantic, right? Yeah. You know? And you I, had to wear, I had to wear husky jeans. Yeah, same, same. It's ridiculous. It was husky jeans or the damn, uh, oh, what were the pants that swooshed everywhere you walked? The parachute were, pants? The parachute yes, pants. The parachute yeah, pants. way way better than wearing the, <laughs> the jeans, man. Those were comfy. Well, AJ, I'll tell you, you know, Ted and I reminisce about uh, New Jersey, where we both grew up, because we would either go into the Chess King. Is that right, Ted? The Chess King? Oh, yeah. The, all the that Chess stuff? King was uh, and Dress Barn. They were big in the malls. Chess King. Chess King was a big one. Yeah. Well, getting off topic, you know, before we jump into the pharmacy, as, as we want to get into that piece for you, dentistry. 
to pharmacy. I mean, you did go into the healthcare field. Is that right? Talk about your path from dentistry before you went into this entrepreneurial world and jumped into pharmacy and even beyond that. Yeah, it's funny. So when I went to college, I mean, I grew up in a household. My dad was a Persian guy. My mom's as oaky and as white as they possibly come. I'm whatever mixed breed that makes me. But my dad's standard was like, you know, you can be anything you want to be, a doctor, a doctor, or a doctor. You choose, you know, freedom of choice is yours. And so <laughs> that was just the way we were brought up. And so when I went to pharmacy school or when I went to college, uh, I really just started working through the progression. I started shadowing docs and then I ended up shadowing a good friend of mine's dad who was a prosthodontist. And I thought, man, this is it. Like this dude is whistling in on his way to work. He between patients, riding his bike to work, like love and life. I'm like, this dude figured it out. So I got to go this route and really committed to it all the way till my senior year of college. And my dad owned an irrigation company. I was digging trenches out in some guy's front yard. He opens the garage up and for all the wrong reasons, I get real excited, right? There's a Porsche Cayenne twin turbo in the garage. There's a Dodge <laughs> Viper sitting in the garage. He's got plasma televisions in his house that were 40 grand a pop at the time. I'm like, I don't know what this dude does, but I need to do this, you know? And so that's the guy who enlightened me to pharmacy, talked me into coming and checking out the stuff he was doing and really spoke to me. He's like, look, man, the dentist you're, you're following around, the cardiologists that come golfing with me, et cetera, those guys are limited by their two hands. And if they're not in there making money with those two puppies, they're not making money. And he's like, I'm out here on the golf course making more than all of them. And my stuff's running in the background, right? And so as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, whatever age you are at that point, I'm like, oh, damn, this guy's got it. You know, and so... I literally pivoted from going to the dental exam that I had been preparing for for four years and just went and randomly took a pharmacy exam, did the pharmacy entrance, went and did the interviews and joined pharmacy school, not knowing a damn thing about anything when it came to pharmacy. So it was a huge left turn out of uh, everything else that I was working on and kind of led me to where I'm at. He got busted for fraud, by the way. So there's a whole nother podcast just on my relationship with that guy. But uh, <laughs> it, it did get me started down this path. AJ, take us behind a little bit a bit about how the pharmacy business works. Because I feel like, you know, if you're even in a small town and obviously there are big, big chains like CVS and, and Walgreens that are out there today, you know, Rite Aid, no more really. Um, what and, and you know, these drugstores are like the mini general stores today to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, what's the setup in terms of the kind of inventory you have to have to get one of these open and how how you actually purchase medications or the way that you do it and resell right. them? What's the general model look like? Yeah, so just to kind of walk you through the landscape of pharmacy, for those who don't know, when I say independent pharmacy, I get two responses. It's either my mom and pop store or it says it's something like a Walgreens. Those tend to be the two yeah. responses that come out of people's mouths. So, you know, your Walgreens, your CVS, your Walmart, your Kroger's, these guys who are the chain pharmacies in the space, you know, they all comprise different levels. Some have seven, 8,000 stores, so on and so forth. When you look at independent pharmacy as a whole across the United States, give or take, it's about 20,000 independent locations across the United States. So it's a significant number of your quote unquote mom and pop stores who are taking care of a good chunk of the population, right? From a getting the business started, there's a lot of regulation, right? State, federal, narcotic stuff. There's a lot of different licenses that have to happen before you're even legitimate uh, to have a pharmacy. You got to have a pharmacist on site, et cetera. And then at that point, once you're set up, then yeah, you can order drugs. You're you're ordering drugs through a particular wholesaler. This whole market's been really consolidated. Everyone's kind of watching. It's like, why are drug prices so high? Why are, it's a very convoluted space, right? And there's a lot mm. of hands in the pot. And so you see guys like Mark Cuban and you see things like GoodRx out there and you see all of these different players trying to come in, Amazon, trying to come in and disrupt a little bit because it's gotten so consolidated. With the guys who negotiate drug pricing to the guys who sell us the drugs, so on and so forth. And so it's simple though, right? It's cost of goods. The only thing that sucks about pharmacy is we don't set the price points. We get told, we, we're in an environment now that it's been so consolidated. We get told what the contract terms are, and that's what we sell the drugs for, whether they're above water or below water. 
um, as far as margin goes. So there's a huge misconception. Someone comes in like, oh my God, my drug's a thousand dollars. This pharmacist is getting loaded off me. There's a good <laughs> chance that pharmacist just sold you that at a hundred dollar loss because it's a terrible planned drug, uh, you know, through your insurance or whatever it might be. So the problem stems much higher than what you see at the retail front, especially from a small business standpoint. So this really puts us as small business owners into the uh, put your business management hat on big time to pay attention to the type of business, right? Pharmacy 20 years ago, if you had a pulse and you were breathing, you were an ideal customer, right? The more that was wrong with you, the better, the more we could sell you, come in the door, we're going to make money. I don't care, right? And now it's no longer that way. It's what plan are you on? What drugs are you taking? You know, what are your ailments? Can can we take care of you and not lose money? Can we make money on? The so it's really changed the landscape of what pharmacy look like, even in the time I've owned, which is not, you know, not been in that 20 year band. So I'm going to segue a little bit to something. And I say segue, maybe it isn't. How do you get not only from dentistry to pharmacy, but then also you've been working in real estate and you are an owner of a bank. I'm going to keep throwing these pitches out there. Is that is this accurate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just different investments. So part of the Persian bloodline is like you just got to own real estate. It's like, you, <laughs> you know, mandatory again. And so my dad did it in a small level, very small level, a few rental properties, part of his retirement portfolio. And I'm like, yeah, of course, for me, everything's like, well, if you can do it this way, why can't? And we do it times a hundred, you know? And so I decided yeah, there's no need to have, you know, five doors. Why don't I have 500? And so I just started accumulating real estate. Um, literally the minute I had enough money in my bank account to put a down payment down. I mean, when I finished pharmacy school as a student paying $150,000 to go to school, going into debt. I mean, I was the one crawling back to my dad, like, Hey, can I borrow? Borrow fifteen hundred bucks to rent my first place, so until my pharmacist salary kicks in, right? As I was waiting on licensing, and so that was a stark moment. Empty bank account, you know, da da da, and and took the first job, and then as soon as I had, I remember writing the first check, man. I it was a thirty thousand dollar down payment on my first property, and I just remember thinking, okay, I'm about to drain the bank account again. I got to play Monopoly. I got to play Monopoly, and so I just did it, you know, and. Um, just continue to do it from that point on. I'm close to about a hundred doors of real estate, somewhere in that that range. Um, got into a little bit of commercial as well, so I like it. It's a, it's another good avenue that I'm comfortable with as far as how to make money, how to add some value, you know, how to keep it up, etc. And I know my markets pretty well. I'm in a college town. North Texas is not far from me, so I'm in good growth areas. Uh, to capitalize on real estate. But, but talk the about bank thing yeah, was, real estate and the bank thing. I'm dying about the bank segue. Yeah, the, the bank thing was pure curiosity. So I had a good friend of mine who ended up becoming the the chair of the bank and hit me up and said, hey, man, I got a bunch of gray haired people uh, sitting on my board. I need some I need some young talent in here, bring some innovation to the table. And uh, so I dedicated a few years and I thought if I'm going to sit on the board, I might as well put some money at play, too. Uh, so I got involved, invested, and and uh, they've been on a phenomenal growth path. I spent a few years uh, on the board with them. Uh, they've put some rock stars in there and really done a good job expanding and growing and ambitions set to go over a billion dollars. And so it's it's been really cool. And for me, borrowing money and and wanting to understand the system, I'm a sucker, you know, on, from a curiosity standpoint. And the best way to get in and do it is just be a part of it. And so I just jumped in and did it. And it was a very enlightening, uh, you know, so for everyone out there who wants to do some stuff, banks want to give you money. They want to give you as much money as they can responsibly give you. So figure out how to take it and go use the heck out of it. You know what I mean? That's the that's the moral of the story. So you, you, from all these physical pharmacies, um, this idea of getting a, a web-based way to deliver medication through drugstore to door, um, how did that begin? And was there a lot of regulations, AJ, around it to because when you're delivering stuff online, especially medications or things like that, uh, was that, was that, how does that model work and was it difficult to get it going? Yeah. So for us, as I was looking at this conglomerate of 20,000 stores and you got a bunch of, you got 20,000 individual owners, right? Or whatever the makeup ends up being, right? Let's say 15,000 own 20,000 of the stores, whatever. It yeah. may. That's like herding cats, right? There's no way you're going to get 15,000 independently thinking business owners to all do the same thing. 
So for me, I thought, how can I solve a selfish need for the pharmacies first, which is give them an avenue to generate income online so that I can produce Walgreens style, Amazon style, Walmart style shopping experience for a mom and pop store who could never uh, deploy the resources to give themselves that type of presence for a customer where I can come in and shop and get over the counter goods and order my prescriptions and pay you for them, book a flu shot for three o'clock on Thursday, like do all of the things I would do in that pharmacy walking in physically. And the piece for me was let's create the network, let's create the connectivity. If we do it around the basis of the independent pharmacy, who's completely under all the regulatory stuff, then we can build the technology to respect their stuff. And then we can expand from there. And so mm. we're almost every state at this point. And now we've started phase two of the project, which is here's a membership program. Come in. I can link you to the closest independent pharmacy to you. You can get all of your goods. You can order everything on online. I can discount your generics to ridiculously low prices. I can get you over the counter discounts and I can get someone to be in a courier vehicle, dropping it off during this podcast, right to your door, right? In the same time frame. So there's this huge untapped, like you, when you talk about last mile and you talk about the ability to get to consumers across the United States, we're closing that void here. And we're doing it in a way that solves the selfish need first, which is whether I send you customers or not, you're going to go make more money because I've provided you an avenue online to generate income. But now as I start advertising and I get customers in your zip code or within a mile, two miles, three miles of you, you're going to follow my standard. I'm going to send them to you and you're going to pump whatever they need to them. And if you don't meet it, then I'll get the guy next next to you down the road to go ahead and pick up the slack and take care of that customer in a meaningful way. And how do you market it out where so people know that it's out there? Do you market to other pharmacists? Is it like a direct to consumer model? Do you do Facebook ads? You know, how, how do you actually all, get more more customers to the website? Yeah, all the above. So our first approach over the last year and a half or so has been real strict B2B. Because we needed enough pharmacies in the network to be beneficial, right? And so we went in and went on a tear. Uh, we brought on you know, close to 500 locations over last year. Uh, um, and so, and growing it at that pace. And so our objective is to have at least 5,000 pharmacies inside of this network. This year, we started going direct to consumer now. So utilizing things like Hulu and Facebook and Instagram and some of the key areas uh, where we can go out and get these consumers to start to learn about uh, the model. So yeah, and now like we're with some groups who are doing the same. AJ, it doesn't sound like there's, you're short on any level of success. So I do have two questions is, in the list of all the things you've done, first one is, what is your biggest achievement? But the second question, which I'm most interested in, what's your biggest failure or mistake yeah, you yeah. made? So start with the achievement. Well, you can start on either one if you want to end on a high note or a low note. Yeah, you bet. You bet. So biggest achievement, honestly, is just where we are today. Um, I don't think there's one thing I would go point to and be like, this is the thing. There were certain benchmarks or income levels that I made or things that I have, I have done along the way where I took the two seconds to be like, hell yeah, did that. But then you're over it in about the same two seconds and you're on to the next thing. So for me, I am I feel like our biggest accomplishment is we started drugstore to door through COVID. We pushed through COVID. We came in, built a real network. We got out there, got hands on. We're actually starting to kind of make waves uh, in a real way in our industry. So I think we're in the process of that huge achievement. Um, and so it's just a fun place to be, to get up with all the challenges. I say fun loosely, like pain, pain agony, all the things that come with fun of ownership. Uh, there are days you want to jump off the roof. There are other days where you're feeling really good about all the things that are going on. So let me preface, preface the fun with the reality. Um, but it's good to have the challenge. And you know, the biggest failure for me, um, honestly, as I look at, at pharmacy and I look at where we are and how the, the dynamic of the field has changed, I think my biggest failure was early on not realizing how much can change with consolidation of market and what that means when you start shrinking payers, when you start shrinking all of these things and get out of the box really fast, start to pivot really quickly to non-regulated income streams, right? So if I failed somewhere and now I'm playing catch up and doing it through our technology and other places is we should have been the minute we saw vertical integrations from CBS and you see PBMs get squeezed down from this marketplace of driving healthcare costs down to getting consolidated to two or three huge players. 
those all should have been red flags saying, hey, stuff's about to get real tricky because when it comes down to two or three people, the business dynamics are going to change. They're going to set the rules, set the prices, set. So I feel like we're in catch up mode now versus really getting ahead of what we could have at the time to say, hey, we've got patients, we've got foot traffic, we've got people who trust us, who believe in us. Start selling them the cash stuff that insurance has nothing to do with, right? You got people going to, G no knock to GNC, going to GNC and getting bro advice from an 18-year-old when they could be walking into a retail pharmacy, getting it from a doctor of pharmacy who could carry all the same style products. So if I think there's a big fail, it was not understanding or realizing that piece quickly enough. And that's to the detriment of a lot of pharmacy owners closing their doors, just locking it and saying we're done because we can't make money in this environment, right? So it's kind of one that spreads across more than just us. I got to ask one question, Ted, before you jump in. I have to ask this. It's like the medical space and the pharmacy space. What's that whole, again, bear with my ignorance. I'm the common person here, but Perfect. I've always heard it's better to spend cash. Come in, Is do you get a better price for a cash price when I... I know you can't answer about a doctor. You know, I'm going to pay for an MRI. I'm going to pay for something out of pocket. Seems to sometimes be cheaper. What about in the pharmacy space? Do you as a consumer have that option? Yeah, so that's what we've done with drugstore to door consumer side is to say, just like a Mark Cuban program where you can get a cost plus, all of those price points, us as pharmacies, if you get out of the brand name products, we can get really aggressive in generic pricing. And so- we can do the same style of things. If we signed an insurance contract, and I'm not going to speak for the docs out there, but I imagine it plays out a lot the same. If we're told what to charge you, right? So if if some middleman comes and says, you're going to charge Lee uh, uh, $1,000 for this drug, but we're going to pay you, the pharmacy, five bucks for it. We're going to pay the drug, drug manufacturer uh, 400 bucks for it. And we got spread pricing and we're going to take this and this is going in our pocket, right? For negotiating a better price point for you. Yep. So when you start introducing all those hands and this happens every single day, every single drug, every single, like th this is the problem with the industry mm. right now. So that's where, when you come to me and I go, I'm only making five bucks anyways, I'll sell you this drug, right? If the insurance is going to pay me five bucks profit, Profit and a hundred bucks to cover the cost of the drug or whatever it is. So I'm going to make 105 on a hundred dollar cost drug. I'll sell it to you for 105 if your cost is higher than 105. But right? what's the difference between the, so, the brand or the uh, generic? Is there really a difference there? Uh, as far as like chemical formulation or as far as like price point goes? No, we know price points. Different, but how as, effective, like, yeah, how effective? Should we yeah, be scared of the generic? No, we're so regulated in this country that it's not like we have stuff flowing in from all over the place. I would happily put my family on the generic of almost anything uh, and not think twice about it. The, it. the margin of error on the generic to the brand name product is very small. And so with a lot of confidence, you can you can go the generic route. If you can go the generic route, especially from a cost perspective, I always recommend the generic route. Yeah. AJ, I wanted to ask you one one final question here, which I think is interesting. You know, you're doing so many different kinds of businesses, the hundred doors, all the pharmacies, the online uh, program. You know, when you you made a choice in your life to involve fitness in a real serious way and 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 why did you choose to do that and how does it help you? you know, with the energy that you have, I know Lee is an absolute fitness freak, so he'll appreciate what answer you're probably going to give, but you know, how, how did that change how you feel and what you do as an entrepreneur? Man, I think it's probably the reason I'm not on anti-anxiety, anti-depressants. I mean, <laughs> I, honest to God, like there is so much to give to going in and having that release and what you can do um, for your forget the physical, just what you do for the mental is incredible just by going in and challenging yourself in that way. And I've made it a non-negotiable. It's scheduled in, it's in my schedule. It is a non-negotiable. It's once in a while that I get derailed. Um, and it's because it's, it's a huge thing or I've got travel. And even in my traveling, I find pockets to go um, get it figured out. So it's mental number one and second physical. Uh, 
Um, if you asked me 10 years ago, it was vanity first, mental second, right? Is how good do I look in a, in a uh, pair of swim trunks? And that's what I was focused on. And now <laughs> it's how good do I feel mentally uh, and physically? And then, you know, how do I look? So just make sure I have at least a decent dad bod and I'm good. So. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I, I want to make a comment, Ted, before you wrap up. You know, what yeah. I do love, the subtlety, is your logo, by the way. Your website is clean, very clean, high, the, the, the photos, the the imagery, the ease of use. That's I, I'm sure it was intentional. The ease of use is wonderful. So start there. Yeah. But also, I love the two in your logo, that it actually looks like a GPS or like a coordinate because of the, you know, because of the deliverable to home. So it's really subtle in there and it's, it's well done, by the way. I really love the way that that looks. Thank you. We had a lot of back and forth going down this road, a lot of arguments around putting a two in the middle of a name and the name being too long. And so there was a lot of back and forth in determining the route we were going to go. And we knew we had a B2B sell. And so it's confusing on the B2B, but it's not confusing on the B2C because the consumer knows exactly what it means. So we had to overcome the B2B hurdle of having this name, knowing what our phase two goals were. Um, so it was an interesting challenge, but thanks for pointing that out. Well, AJ, for the folks that are watching today, we have a lot of business owners um, that tune into our program how can they, I guess, start buying their medications and, and uh, prescriptions from you and do it, doing it directly? And how can they get more information about you and all the companies that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So my social is terrible. I have no real intention on my social. I should probably get on there and take a little bit of my time to focus on, on clear messaging. But you can see a hodgepodge of crap I like to get into there. Uh, but you can follow me, AJ Asgary. Uh, even ajasgary.com will hyperlink you out. Um, to some of my stuff. Uh, you can see some of my speaking engagements, things like that. And then go to drugstore two door, the number two door.com and just check it out. If we don't have a pharmacy in your area and you go in and sign up, I will actively, myself or my team will actively go after independence in your area to serve you. So it's not like because it's not there today, it won't be tomorrow. It's just more horsepower for us to go in and get them on board more quickly, right? So we'll get requests in areas and I'll go pull pharmacies on. And within 60 days, you've got a resource uh, at your fingertips that wasn't there before. Well, we appreciate you taking time and being on the uh, the shrimp tank with us today, uh, sharing your expertise in real estate. And it's always interesting to hear about these new business models. Lee, next week we've got on Alicia Branham, she has uh, almost 30,000 followers on Instagram, and she's a social media expert. She's going to talk to people about how to do that very thing. How do you increase your, your social mobility and presence to grow more followers and more business online? So we'll do that next week. And uh, AJ, continued success, and uh, thanks for being a fellow entrepreneur. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to this week's broadcast of The Shrimp Tank. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank.